Hi guys, is this thing on? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, I'm Knud. I'm going to talk about OSDP. I work at a boutique consulting company called Fractal, and that's it about me. For this next hour or so, we're going to go through an overview of how physical access control systems work uh, in the real world, uh, common weaknesses you would see in said systems, and then we're shifting to OSDP and the role it plays in access control systems, and then we're going to talk about how to audit said installations and components. So for a physical access control system overview, no matter if it's OSDP or something else, the systems can either be custom vendor designed magical turnkey solutions where it's the same logo on all the things, uh, full of proprietary protocols so that you need to buy the other things when something breaks, uh, or it can be interoperable or standards driven, right? Uh, and if we look at something like standalone solutions, those are typically not uh, very secure uh, because the logic is too close to the data side, so I won't be talking about those. Because, I mean, if you consider something like an electronic door lock where the access control is in the door, it's no good, right? Uh, the vendor design solutions are going to be speaking obscure protocols which do nothing for security, but uh, mainly work so that you buy their stuff. And then if you look at the flow I've tried to describe here, you will have a token which will speak with a reader which will in turn speak with the panel responsible for sending a signal to unlock the door and then the user management happens on some computer so, uh, somewhere in some room. So that's a normal uh, component overview. And the current physical access control status, at least from all the things I've looked at, is it's an absolute dumpster fire, right? Because we have the clonable low frequency tags um, and you have the hackable and or exploitable high frequency tags and then you have uh, readers with issues and you have access panels with other issues and then you have the backends which have many 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 more issues uh, i spent some time looking at those and those are very enterprise uh, and of course even in this modern day and age i am um, people are still installing uh, systems using MyFair and Weekend protocols, um, and MyFair has been broken since 2007, I think, but you still see it being deployed today where people can uh, clone the tags. And, well, I think it's uh, fairly irresponsible, and you have some uncommitted installers, but, but it, is, it is what it is, uh, and, and that's the way of the world right now. If you look at Weekend briefly, uh, it's the gold standard for communicating from the card reader towards the access panel on the secure side of the door. And the protocol is equivalent to plain text, meaning that the way it works is that when you beep your token, no matter what kind of token it is, after the reader itself has um, read the data off your token, it's going to blurt a number over the wire uh, to the inside, and then that number will decide whether the door is going to open or not. Uh, and it's exploitable to the extent that you can buy a product to, well, to exploit it, right? You can buy the ESP key. It's a 79 bucks weekend interception tool, which lets you sniff and uh, replay traffic uh, at will. If we then look at how you would, uh, we can decide how you would attack a modern physical access control system. You can attack the tokens, and the downside of that is that you have to obtain the token. And I think the main, the main risk associated with tokens is that uh, you can clone or duplicate the tokens because, after all, they just store a number. Uh, and then for the integrated tags, uh, the, the low frequency tags, you can do, let's say, long range reading, and that's definitely long range in that maybe a meter or so, right? And then the next layer of defense in the system is the reader itself. Uh, the reader is on the danger side of the door uh, because, well, it's on the outside. And something you could do when you want to attack a reader is that you can maybe do a key extraction from 
a reader which is placed at, let's say, the bike shed, which could be a low, low security area as opposed to the reader guarding the front door, for example. But for ease of use, you would maybe have the same card to open both places. Uh, and of course, what you can do with the reader as well is you can reconfigure it or maybe flash some malicious firmware or just do some denial of service attacks. Uh, to, I mean, you can smash them or do EM attacks that fry the innards and, and so on and so on. Is that useful? It depends, right? Um, and then the next layer again on the other side of the reader is that you can attack the communications going from the reader to the access panel so you can record and replay and do direct injections of manipulated token data. Uh, but to do that, you need to be able to identify the communication protocol on the wire. So there's a little bit of preparatory work you need to do if you want to attack it that way. Uh, and then, of course, you can attack the access panel itself uh, or the backend software. And then that's a chicken egg problem because to attack the backend, you need to be on the network. And the reason that you're attacking the physical access control system in the first place is to get inside so you can get on the network, right? So it's a little bit, well, maybe you can do some zone jumping and get access to places where you're not allowed to be by attacking the, the backend system. Uh, yes, uh, for the reconfiguration of the reader, uh, I skipped over that part. Something you could do is you could uh, reconfigure it to accept uh, weak or insecure tags instead of only, let's say, dash fire tags, which are still secure-ish. So, uh, times are changing, finally, right? Uh, ESP key hopefully will kill off weekend for good, uh, because, I mean, when you can buy a product to hack facilities, then things need to change, right? Uh, so, in comes OSDP, which is the Open Supervised Device Protocol. And, of course, with standards, you get some security for free, because you can, if they're standards compliant, you can test uh, one thing or build a test case for one thing, and then you can replay that one on other things and see that it doesn't fall for the same mistakes, for example. Uh, OSDP solves other problems than just uh, sniffing and replaying, because uh, you can now actively communicate with the devices, and you get interoperability between vendors, uh, and you well, now you have an actual communication channel uh, instead of the weekend number spitting, right? So if we look at the evolution, uh, we're going weekend, uh, from, you, which is basically unidirectional point-to-point uh, -point bit spitting in that the reader, one reader will spit bits to one uh, access panel, uh, where now in OSDP it's a bus network with addressing. So the panels have addresses, uh, the, the readers have addresses, and uh, well, they can communicate so you can Let's, uh, you can have things like, uh, if it's a fingerprint scanner, you could have duress fingers, for example, and things like that, and, and make it a little bit more advanced. Um, and yeah, uh, OSDP version one, it brings nothing uh, from a security perspective because it is, it only brought the bi-directional or bus network communication. Uh, security features were not, baked in yet. OSDP version 2 is built on top of OSDP version 1, and now they add uh, encryption and smart card pass-through communication and biometric reader support and other things. So when you encounter OSDP in the real world, it will, with a degree of certainty, be OSDP version 2, because OSDP version 1 was, let's call it a draft. Uh, Made in 2008 uh, between HIT, Mercury, and Linnell, so the big, big players in uh, the physical access control area. In comes the Security Industry Association, which is also run by some of the same people, and they made OSDP version 2. And it is now standardized in an IEC document in 2020, and it's, I would say it's still evolving. Um, the C document is up to version 2.2, .2, uh, 
and the standard is free to use, which is great. Uh, if you want the standard document to see how, it, how to use it, well, you need to buy the document, right? Um, it's bi-directional, as I said, and now it's spoken on top of half duplex RS-485. And you can have one kilometer long cable runs, which is pretty good for installers and less good for defenders, I think. You can pass a set of verification tests so that you can say you are OSDP verified. Uh, that means that, well, you, are, you live up to a minimum set of baselines, but when you look at what, what, uh, what it actually does, it mostly looks like uh, conformance testing, and then there's some optimistic phrasing in it, um, because when you read this, it says that the device uh, shall detect removal from mounting if that provides access to the internal elements. So shall detect that, I mean, yes, it, it shall detect, but, but it doesn't say it must detect, right? So you can be compliant and not be secure, actually. And when you look at something like the profiles as described by SIA, you can have the OSDP basic profile, um, the, and as they say, it's weekend replacements, and they provide supervision benefits of a bidirectional protocol, protecting them from the common person in the middle attacks. Uh, this is not true, right? Uh, because, well, if you if you take it absolutely literally and say I want to be person in the middle, then yes, you can go and you can cut the wire and you can put yourself in between, and then. Yes, it will detect that you have tampered with the cable, but since it's a bus network, you can actually just uh, vampiric tap onto the bus and then start injecting traffic or sniffing traffic uh, on par with the reader itself, right? So the basic profile is no good. And then you have the secure profile, uh, which supports encryption. Briefly on terminology, it's no longer a reader, it's now a peripheral device, uh, and there are multiple different peripheral, peripheral, it's very hard to say, peripheral types. Um, so it can be, well, peripheral is the very minimal, and then basic, uh, there would be something like the classic card reader, right? And then you have the extended packet mode, which is interacting with smart credentials, such as smartphones and smart cards. The access panel is now an ACU, if you ask IEC, and it's a CP if you ask SIA, so it's either an access control unit or a control panel. They don't agree. And other than that, uh, things work the same as I described. So you still have a token that talks to a thing, that talks to a thing, that talks to the back end. And to avoid confusion, I'll try to refer to the ACU as a panel and the PD as the reader. Just but let's see, let's see how well it goes. OSTP supports smart card communication, pretty cool. Um, it, it is basically, and it supports it in two different ways. Uh, it can either do something called extended packet mode or it can do transparent mode. One of them is, has some licensing issues around it. So theoretically, uh, all the security logic is passed um, to the ACU on the secure side of the door, right? And if you have done any, if you've looked at something like credit cards, for example, um, you have the challenges of the over the internet relay attacks, right? So in IEC 14443, uh, you have a frame waiting time of 77 milliseconds, and if you exceed that and there's no answer in the RFID communication, then uh, the connection is considered as severed. But, but if you actually look at how much latency you get from doing things, uh, relaying uh, traffic, well, fiber will add five milliseconds per 1,000 kilometer. Uh, so it's not unreasonable that you can, over the internet, with a decent, well, especially now with the 5G traffic, that you can hold your own reader up to someone's card and then relay it over the internet to a guy who has a card emulator somewhere else. 
And anyway, there's one verified vendor that supports this smart card communication. Uh, for the relay stuff, um, there may be some token-specific solutions. Uh, if you look at Desfi EV2, it has some proximity checks, as they call it, but it's basically just the timing checks, right? So if you respond too slow on the RFID communication, they know that you're up to no good. And of course, the advantage of uh, passing the logic directly to the secure side is that you don't have to expose your Desfi keys in readers mounted outside your building. Another feature in OSDP is that it has biometric reader support, uh, and it's, for some reason, it's a self-contained or isolated functionality in the protocol, uh, which, which means that when you, well, then it's not biometrics as such, it's more of a fingerprint, right? Ah, and then you have iris scans, but what, what, what about my bone density that will be in OSDP version 3? I don't know. Um, something, when you look at documentation like this, uh, something you definitely don't want to see uh, is the supported fingerprint formats where it says send raw fingerprint data as a PGM because that means that it's going to send a photo of your fingerprint and store a photo of your fingerprint in the back end instead of the fingerprint minutiae, as you can see, uh, laid out here with the bifurcations and ridges and, and all that fingerprint slaying. So, I mean, PGM is a portable gray map, right? So it's basically sending off this data instead of just the information about your fingerprint, which is the way that many other readers do it instead. And when you look at the protocol and how OSDP works, it's a little bit weird that um, here actually the OSDP bio read message has to be sent from the ACU to the reader itself. So you go, okay, now read the fingerprint. So there's a lot of, it feels like an afterthought at least that this has been tagged on. Um, so if we look at how OSDP version two with the secure channel works, in the standard version 2.1.5, there is a sample secure channel establishment session with a sample shared SCPKD, which is like, well, this key, right? And then you read the next version of the spec, and now this sample key is actually the default key, right? Uh, and then Funnily or confusingly, uh, a Swedish vendor does not. Well, they have blacklisted this key because they don't want you to use that key from the from the previous version of the spec because they go, people are going to use these, copy paste these keys as you've seen in many other places. Uh, but now actually the spec has evolved so that the access reader uh, or panel does not accept the standard key that it's supposed to accept uh, according to the spec, right? So interesting and very much uh, an evolving <coughs> standard still. Uh, the way it's used is that this default key is now used to protect the communication channel during the key set events where you deploy the actual encryption keys because the spec requires the channel to be encrypted before you can exchange encryption keys. And then the fact that it's being encrypted with a key that everybody knows. Well, so, and besides that, I didn't look too much at the secure channel crypto because I just, I mean, I'm not a crypto guy. I just treat it as a constant and know that it's there and it's probably okay-ish. Uh, the communication flow, the way it works is that the reader itself cannot initiate communication. Uh, the panel actually sends a steady stream of OSTP poll messages constantly, and then the reader, uh, no matter what you do, like if you read a token, uh, those token reads are then sent as responses to these polls. So the reader, uh, the panel goes, the normal flow is like it goes ping pong, ping pong, ping pong constantly, right? But then it goes ping, and then it goes card read, right? So that, that's how it works uh, in, in terms of, also in terms of, timing and multiple readers on, on the bus and so on. So the spec says it's 
bidirectional, and yes, you can argue that it is, but 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 uh, but when you can only respond in case somebody has asked you to talk first, I don't know how bidirectional it is. Uh, so in regular computing terms, all the peripherals, the readers are servers, and the panel uh, acts as a client which constantly sends requests and acts on responses. The message format itself is not terribly complicated uh, because you have a static start of message marker and then you have the address of the thing you want to communicate with and then you have some length fields and then some message control information which is a very short sequence number which is not for security. Uh, it, I think it's mostly for order because it's well it's maximum four it goes zero one two three and then it counts again, uh, so, so it's, not a, it's not a security sequence number, for sure. And then you have the checksum, and then uh, you have a flag that says, uh, is security enabled or not? And if security is enabled, then you have some more of this stuff. So the previous slide didn't have the actual message, because then it gets very small, but this is what the actual message part looks like, and then the trailing checksum and or CRC. So byte 6, as you can see here, uh, holds the, the actual command or reply. So let's say, let's call it opcode, right? So a sample message uh, on the wire with secure channel disabled would look like this with the addresses and lengths and then the command and then the response, right? And then some CRC tagged on. Uh, and then we have the same with secure channel enabled. So now we've enabled encryption, right? Uh, but if we look on the wire, uh, we can see that actually the security block type 15 means that it is from the panel to the reader and it is not encrypted. And then type 16 is the same, but the other way. So. The ping pong pattern we see here in the command, so the 60 is outbound and then the 40 is the response, looks the same uh, despite secure channel being enabled because, well, I guess you can save some, some bandwidth by not encrypting the ping pong flow. I don't know, man. It, I didn't make it. I'm, so as you can see, we have a secure channel established and the MAC is included, but the data field is unencrypted. Uh, and, and now you have encryption supported, but not mandated, which means that you can check the box in your compliance sheet that says secure channel is enabled, but that doesn't mean that it's encrypted. So how do you get on the bus? Well, it's async serial over RS-485. And what that means is you buy a USB dongle or these tiny Max 485 things. Uh, it costs five euro and then you have a regular TTY on your computer. Uh, so now you can speak RS-485. Uh, and then once you've verified that it's actually OSDP, uh, you can trick your computer uh, into thinking um, that things are happening on the bus, so you can do some STTY stuff uh, and mod probe the USB mod and then just cat the thing, and then you can make some Wireshark coloring rules uh, so you don't have to write an actual Wireshark decoder, but this is enough to start looking at the traffic as it flows. A nightmare with working with those OSDP things is that the spec says that you should uh, pull the wire high, uh, so you send uh, FF on before the message, uh, so that it knows to expect an incoming packet, uh, and maybe half the devices I've looked at do it, and the other half doesn't, uh, and then you end up with something that looks like this, but luckily you only have to write those uh, coloring rules once, and then when you sniff the traffic, uh, you can easily see whether, uh, well, here I just, I made just a simple red, green, right? So green, good, encrypted, and red, not encrypted, bad. So this is what it looks like. And then with this, uh, armed with this, you can quickly uh, hook on to an OSDP bus and see if it's actually using a secure channel or not and what is being encrypted. 
free tooling you can use OSDP Python if uh, and some other things. You can use the LibOSDP conformance toolkit uh, made or released by SIA at least. Uh, it has a sniffer which may be useful except it's not, it doesn't work if the device is not OSDP compliant which means if it doesn't pull the, uh, pull the wire high before sending the data then the sniffer will not see anything. LibOSDP is actually an implementation which you can take and use freely so it might be used as the base for some systems because you can get full OSDP functionality without actually having to do anything yourself except add bugs on top, I guess. So it's okay to use um, LibOSDP and things like that uh, when you are building things. I don't think it's so useful when you're breaking things. At least you need to start uh, messing with the, with the framework. So to speak OSDP manually, to be freed of the constraints of the framework, you actually just need to implement uh, CRC or checksum fields and then come up with some protocol practicalities such as sizes. And this is enough, um, this little bit of Python is enough to, for you to start injecting uh, arbitrary plain text well-formed OSDP packets onto the bus to exercise parsers in readers and panels. And the OSDP checksum looks like this. Uh, this is, and again, this is part of the standard. Uh, this is for a low, low compute devices. Uh, so if you have a very underpowered device, you can use the checksum. Uh, and if you have a more powerful device, you can use the CRC. Not that I think it makes a lot of difference in the real world. But those are the, those are the things. Uh, you need to tag on to make sure that the packet is well formed and of course uh, once you have these deviations you also need to test for, for both cases when you make your test framework because there might be bugs that only manifest if you're using the CRC uh, for packet verification. So OSDP issues. Uh, it's multi-drop and can handle 127 devices on a single wire. Uh, th that means, in my opinion, that, well, it's a very, very long cable now, and, and instead of uh, just securing communication from something like that one to the panel uh, on the other side, you now have to secure one full kilometer of wire, uh, provided you go to the full, full uh, capability. Right, but this means that that you can you can have the same controller controlling the room cupboard and the server room, and in terms of security, it's not not ideal, at least. And of course, uh, all the added features uh, that make this protocol a good replacement for weekend uh, bring complexity as well, right? Because now it's a very long bus network you're securing. As I touched on briefly uh, with secure channel, the, there is still plain text metadata in the message passing uh, and only some payload bodies are encrypted. So something like a card read will be encrypted, but some others uh, may not be, right? Um, and when you have something like this where you can say, I don't use encryption or I use encryption, that means that the logic uh, required to, to process the messages on the back end uh, expands, right? Because what if you, uh, what if you send uh, plain text card read events and say, well, it doesn't have to be encrypted, right? Uh, here, and here's the card data. Then, well, we're back at weekend with tamper detect, right? Uh, so if you don't have fully implemented secure channel, you have the exact same problems uh, as uh, we're trying to get away from by implementing this, right? Uh, and except you have more problems now because now you need to handle uh, firmware upgrades and all sorts of other things. Um, I'm not sure why, why you design a new protocol and then, uh, they, then take these decisions at least. 
Some of the decisions have been rolled back. Uh, the master key scheme, uh, as described in 2.1.5, where the secure channel base key is made by concatenating a master key and then something from the card reader. Uh, that, that has been deprecated in favor of the other scheme now, uh, where, where you use the secure channel base key to transmit unique per reader encryption keys. So again, we're back at uh, concatenating shared secrets and public info uh, and using that as encryption material and then storing this uh, outside the building somewhere, right? So because the, the device needs to be able to derive the key from its own info and the shared secret. It's a bad place for secret storage outside the building, at least. An easy attack uh, on OSDP is that you can reset the secure channel um, and both ends of the, of the communication can invalidate the established session. It's complicated to do it uh, protocol-wise, uh, but, but if you just send out-of-order data with the wrong MAC or sequence number, the one, two, three, four, or zero to three sequence number. If that's wrong, it's enough to reset the, the communications, right? And you can also just choke the choke the bus by spamming random data and waiting for for it to reset, and it will generate alerts and or events. Um, and of course, the outcome is the same, but but it's different ways of doing it. Uh, and the main advantage of this channel reset is that you get to follow the secure channel setup and see if it matches keys that you may have uh, being default or otherwise weak. And it allows you to track the session state, which is required if you want to actually inject into the secure channel. So since it supports uh, the Mac, when encryption is enabled, um, it's a four-byte Mac. Um, it might it might seem small, but I think in the context of, well, the way they do it is they calculate the full Mac, but then they truncate it. So to save bandwidth, they only tra transmit uh, four bytes of the Mac. But in the context of a 9600 board link, it might be okay uh, because it's uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of packets you need to transmit to be able to inject a packet with the correct Mac attached uh, and inject it the right place at the right time. And when you have these bandwidth constraints on the bus, uh, all of a sudden a 32-bit Mac is a lot of uh, ground to cover. And of course, uh, the problem. One of the problems as well with, with the Mac implementation fails is that it's impossible to peek under the hood and see what's happening on, the, on these embedded devices, right? At least unless you have a lot of time and a lot of money. So you as the end user of this just have to believe that, that hopefully things are implemented well. So another OSDP attack is uh, main in the middle with SCPKD. So that was the default key I mentioned before. Uh, if this is indeed in use, it is trivial to connect and get on the bus and then handle the connection for both sides and maybe you have to drop communications briefly. Uh, but again, it gives you full man in the middle capability and takes it back to the plain text security level. So this, is, this would be an actual in the middle attack and not on the bus if, if you're so inclined. So, when you look at the spec, uh, when the reader is in provisioning state, uh, it has the default SCPK provided, uh, pro as, as provided in the standard, right? Uh, and in this state, the ACU can set a new SCPK, um, but who says it does? Uh, so, and, and uh, the reader should also exit install mode uh, after this, but who says it does, right? So, so there's a lot of things that you need to audit when you need to review one of these installations. Um, you can send an OSDP PDCAP message. It is a peripheral device capability, uh, and that will reveal from the reader itself if it uses the SCPKD, because uh, there is a field in the response where it says that uh, 
if a certain bit is set, then it's the default key, right? So at least you can interrogate the you can interrogate the reader and say, are you using the default key? And it will say, yes, I am, or it will not respond, right? So very good uh, for auditing, at least. And of course, when you want to attack these uh, installations in the real world, uh, you have the challenge that the messages have to fit inside the pull timing, or you can risk triggering offline uh, alerts. Uh, so. There's um, a 200, I think it's 200 milliseconds for the poll timing, and if it loses two polls in a row, then it should trigger a temper alert. Um, and that, uh, but as an attacker, one of your problems is also that, that uh, you have 200 milliseconds to get the response in, uh, which means that you can fit in around 186 characters on the default 9600 board bus. Uh, so your payload, both your trigger and your actual payload needs, uh, needs to be collision resistant or adhere to these constraints at least. Uh, and you need to consider that you're injecting onto an active bus, which means that when you transmit data, someone else might transmit at the same time as well. Otherwise, you need to do some very fancy timing stuff. So what you could do is uh, take over the connection entirely and then kick off the real thing. Is it, um, is it realistic? Well, it depends uh, because if somebody is monitoring the temper alerts, then you will get caught. Uh, but as you will often see, once you start working with these systems, nobody is actually looking at the temper stuff because maybe it never triggers or they don't know how to handle it. Uh, so. So of course, as an attacker, you can hope that somebody has bumped the communication speed in the setup. Uh, but, and as I would say, as a defender, if you have one of these systems, don't bump the speed uh, because you don't get a lot out of it. So looking at uh, the readers, uh, things to look for, um, we're back at the key storage and vandalism uh, slash theft procedures. And the shared keys, if you're back on the 2.1.5 with the, the master key scheme. Uh, and as a side note for readers, well, uh, do they support fallback mode for tokens where they accept uh, insecure tags? Uh, do they have tamper-proof screws that, well, they are not really tamper-proof, but they are called tamper-proof screws. Uh, so do you need a special bit that, that, uh, that actually counts? as a security feature in the physical security world that you need a special bit to unscrew the screw and take the reader off the wall. But, hey. um, temper detection on the readers, uh, it's either, I don't think I've seen a magnetic one actually, but, but it's a physical switch which will go click when you take it off the wall, uh, or it's an optical switch which will, well, it doesn't go click, but works in the same way. Um, but does anybody look at the temper? Uh, unlikely. Uh, and are you monitoring the readers? Uh, that you, those should be monitored using a camera, uh, but it shouldn't be recording the pin codes, right? And then who watches these videos to see if anybody has ever tampered with one of the readers? Well, nobody. Uh, I think one of the problems is that as a regular auditor who just wants to come in and see it, that all the things are secure. Uh, you have huge blind spots uh, in terms of introspection capabilities because you can't see shit, right? Uh, the, the reader is the reader, and if the lights are out, you exchange the reader, and if it goes beep when you put the card in, it works, right? That's basically it. And for security reasons, uh, at least some vendors drown the readers in potting compound and use obscure chips where you can't find the data sheets. Uh, and it's not exactly easy to audit them without a laboratory and a lot of time uh, on your hands. Uh, and of course, there are many other interfaces to attack besides uh, OSDP when you're auditing readers uh, because there's maybe BLE or RF for 100 different token types uh, because 
if you have an indial attack or a hit uh, low frequency attack, well, the it's RFID tags, but they actually speak protocols over the air, right? So more things to audit. Um, when you're exercising something like the OSTP com set um, functionality, you can or key set. It's pretty easy to kick the reader offline and think that you found a great bug uh, because your fuzzer is sending all sorts of random garbage. But it turns out maybe you just reconfigured the communication speed uh, or the key on the reader, and then of course it won't respond. Right. So bear that in mind when you start making your fuzzers. Uh, and I think PD attack effects or reader attack effects are super complicated to inspect uh, because the only thing you can do is you do all your bad stuff and then you need to come in and have a, a positive test case where you actually do a card read event and say, does it trigger and is everything good? So that, that quickly becomes some complicated rigs that you need on your desk to come by and swing the card, but yeah. I think uh, where you will find most of the bugs when you look at the peripherals uh, will be in this area. Uh, come in. <laughs> um, it supports a bunch of fixed length, fixed length messages, uh, which are hard to get wrong uh, when you look at, well, it like the ping pong functionality, for example, you send one byte, you get one byte back, right? Uh, but there are several of them where you actually need to pass the, the data being sent. And these are the ones I thought looked dangerous, at least. So if you have a peripheral that supports, uh, some of them can have a display, and then you can set text on the display, right? Uh, so here's just a basic fuzz for how you would uh, fuzz the display data using BooFuzz, and then you just need to stick that into the serial somehow. Uh, another attack that could be relevant in the real world is where you actually do the reconfiguration, which you want to avoid when you're auditing something, but maybe in the real world, uh, knocking the reader offline because you set the wrong baud rate. Uh, that means that the reader drops out, and somebody comes and says, it's not going beep, okay, replace it, right? Because that's the cheapest, there will be no infield troubleshooting, right? But then you've put your sniffer on the wire and now he needs to configure the new reader and that one is configured with the SCPKD, so the default key, so you can decode the traffic and see what key is being set and then victory, right? Other interfaces on the readers, uh, this is just, uh, it's an HID signal 20, but just as an example, um, this one is managed using smartphone apps or configuration cards, and it supports many, 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 many different types of fobs. Uh, and the OSDP key management is less flexible because it adheres to the standard that says it has to have the, so when you flip the install mode thing, it uses the default key, and when you flip the secure mode, it refuses speaking without secure channel enabled, right? Uh, but there's no way for me of saying I want to use this key, right? So it's the key exchange over the encrypted channel. Uh, and if you look at something like this signal, um, please check the reader configuration and disable all these weird things, right? Because when you have, you spend all those money on your Desfire cards and everything is hunky-dory, but then at the same time, maybe it supports some MyFair Classic at the same time. So check and disable. And then looking at the actual panels uh, and what to do with those, um, well, you need to find the reader wiring documentation because if you just start connecting things at random, um, you might let out the smoke from things. So for the hit signal, you can hook the logic analyzer to the green and white wires, which are also uh, historically used for the weekend channel. Uh, and here, uh, if you're looking at the reader and ACU comes, well, the weekend is easily recognizable and decodes with pulse view, so you can see that if one side sends, uh, the other doesn't, and that's 
that's just how the weekend stuff works. Uh, and if you look at something like another legacy protocol called clock and data, uh, there will be a clock signal and then there will be blips on the data signal uh, on the side, so you can differentiate them that way using a, a cheap logic analyzer. And for OCP, well, you need to guess the baud rate and then start looking at the traffic, as I described earlier. And then, funnily, um, or interestingly, at least, I think, if you look at the way the, the panel works now, it's actually now a multi-home device with a leg on the safe side because it needs to be able to get uh, access list updates of who can open the door and all that stuff. Uh, and then it has the other side of itself being exposed out the building on the danger side, right? Um, because, well, the reader needs to be able to talk to it. So something you can do, uh, some, some ACUs uh, perpetually sweep the bus for new peripherals, uh, and if you then just say, yes, I am a new peripheral on address seven, um, it might allow you to start sending traffic to the, to the panel and just say, I don't speak secure channel, uh, I only speak plain text. Uh, by the way, here's a card read event, uh, and maybe it will open the door, right? Uh, and it's implementation specific what you get, uh, except added attack surface. Uh, so besides misconfigurations uh, and lack of encryption and so on, we now have an actual message parser to attack. So now we're back in familiar territory, finally, right? Now you can actually start sending bad stuff to something that will have to accept it no matter what. So, dangerous responses to panels, same as the previous one. Um, I think the reader itself, despite all my many words about it, is less interesting as a target now compared to the actual panel, right? And dangerous replies that the, the panel must handle, right? Uh, otherwise, well, otherwise the solution won't work, right? So it has to support card reads and all sorts of other fancy fancy things, right? And then. There's even reserved in the spec uh, manufacturer specific, right? So what hides here? Nobody knows. So since the thing has to be able to understand card read events, uh, you can make a basic fuzzer for the card data parsing. So it has uh, some pretty basic data like the reader number and the format code, and then it has a length field for how long is the card data you're gonna send, uh, and then it has the card data, and so on and so on, right? So uh, I think it's much like fuzzing the reader, but better and more interesting, right? So I looked at this particular access panel. Uh, it was available uh, on eBay for 300 euros, which is, Nothing compared to the enterprise solutions, and it also has a baked-in uh, user management system, which means that you don't need to set up something like Linel OnGuard or other enterprise management solutions, which are a nightmare in themselves. Uh, looking at it, well, you can actually you can uh, get a shell pretty easily via some um, some functionality in the web UI, and then the Firmware actually, uh, let's say, unpacks cleanly with Binwalk, so it's a lot easier and nice to be back in familiar territory, right? So now we can do OSTP hacking on something where you can actually see what's happening when you start working on it. Um, and funnily enough, uh, when you send an OSTP raw um, card read event uh, and you tell it that the length of the data you're about to send is zero bytes long, uh, and then you don't send any data, it will uh, misindex something and crash. Uh, and if you send that it's a very long message and send nothing, it will try to read off the end of that buffer and crash. So actually now you have a parser which is written in C, uh, waiting for untrusted complex data from someone outside the building, right? So of course the this is a slightly malformed OCP frame since the, the actual card data is missing, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, you can actually cause it to hang and crash just by doing some 
garbage uh, you random fuzzing uh, towards it. Uh, so this this one doesn't target. I mean the the you random fuzzer here doesn't target uh, any particular OSTP message, but uh, the general OSTP protocol passing, right? Uh, and of course you will get lots of errors and wrong checksums and all that stuff, but it's enough to crash the access panel, right? And it works even with secure channel enabled and or enforced because uh, you're targeting the OSTP parser for the for the uranium stuff, you're targeting the OSTP parser and not the message parsing. Uh, access was an absolute delight to work with. Uh, there was absolutely no bullshit and no weirdness uh, compared to other vendors in this space where I have, well, I looked a lot at the backend software back in the day uh, for various systems, and some of the responses you get from these guys are, that's not true, which, I mean, you just showed them, look at the authentication bypass, and they go, no, it's not true. <laughs> okay. Um, so interesting conversations with, with people. I think one of them said they had an ethical hacker to look at it, and they used hashing, so it was not possible and other strange things like that. But access, no problems at all. Uh, looking at the access panel, though, uh, there are some other weirdness things. Uh, if the reader is disconnected, the panel goes into a sweep pattern. Uh, so with that, you can maybe easily identify that it is an access panel on the inside. Uh, there are no options for configuring the secure channel in the end user facing UI, so you would think that it's not actually possible to do a secure channel, but it is. Uh, there is some crazy API you need to talk to, uh, which it exposes, and then with a lot of patience, in the end you can get it to do secure channel, uh, provided your device doesn't use that SCVKD key because they have blacklisted the default key. So you need, if your device only wants to use the default key, then you need to go and hex edit some of the files so it blacklists some other key instead. Uh, temper alerts, uh, looking at it, uh, it's hidden somewhere weird and you need to configure it first uh, and you can send junk on the bus and there will be no alerts about collisions uh, and all of those things that I do to attack the OTP thing is not registering as, uh, let's say, security events, right? Uh, it, so looking at something like this uh, from, the, from the log where it goes that uh, unexpected sequence number reason to zero, right? incorrect sequence number, uh, device timeouts, CRC errors, and all that stuff. And these are actually security events, not malfunctioning devices, so they shouldn't be hidden in some weird, uh, weird log file that nobody ever looks at, right? Another item which is in the process, uh, this is in the process of being fixed, um, for another device, uh, when you spam random traffic on the bus, the the panel enters a failure state, and then all the readers are silently offline, and the doors won't open, right? Uh, I also, I triggered at least once uh, a crash in the, in, the pay, in the microcontroller where it's locked up uh, so that the tamper switch, uh, the physical tamper switch on the panel no longer worked either, uh, just by sending some malformed OSTP traffic. And a fun one, uh, this uh, Cypress OSM 1000 is actually the cheapest OSTP panel you can find because it works as an OSTP to weekend converter and then it actually functions both ways so you can either have it speak OSTP towards the reader or towards the panel uh, depending on, on how you flip it. Uh, funnily enough, uh, this one supports that default key, so it's a bit of work to get it to work with the, the access panel. Uh, but as you can see, it has security because the secure channel holds weekend hacking with encryption. And a fantastic issue I found in that one. Uh, if you spew junk on the, on the bus, you will cause a teardown of the secure channel, uh, but then 
before the secure channel is re-established, despite the system being configured to only accept secure channel messages. Uh, while the channel is torn down, you can actually sneak in an unencrypted message, uh, so a card read, where you don't need to calculate the Mac and all that stuff, just plain text uh, for a very short while. Uh, yeah, uh, These guys were also very nice to work with. I sent it uh, to, to Cypress who confirmed and reproduced in under three days uh, and had a fix available in two weeks, right? So, and they're gonna do field updates and they sent me a free unit for verification and so on. So I'm very happy with, with that part at least. So if we wanna look at OSTP and PAX and where it's going and where it's heading, well, I think it's a little bit weird that you take OSTP and you take it to version two and then with the secure channel with the master key and then with the default SCBK, with, which is where we're at now. And I think creating a standard that you have to pay uh, to access uh, seems very weird. You can see all this happening uh, again with another protocol called SSCP, where you need to sign NDAs and be in some alliance before you can get access to the standard that you have to pay for, right? Uh, and it seems, well, to me, this seems a little bit too little, too late, and definitely too slow, right? Because they're taking years and years to make something, um, which means that all the people who want a solution in the meantime are deploying these half-baked solutions, right? And, and if you create a standard and you want to dictate conformance rules, I think you should maybe demand some runtime inspection capabilities as part of your protocol creation, right? Uh, and maybe taking all the experience from the InfoSec world and maybe applying it uh, to this, right? Um, they say OSDP over IP is in the works. That's, that sounds terrible. Uh, and there's a TLS version proposed. I mean, OSDP over IP has been in the works since 2014. Uh, and th think about the 32-bit Mac and how that would work in IP land, right? You'd go um, And a TLS version, who wants TLS dangling out of the building, right? Well, not me, at least. Uh, I think we have a lot of secure protocols in IT land, secure-ish, uh, and I think it would be good to learn from these and favoring simplicity over new complexity. I think uh, things will converge towards IP communications eventually, probably wirelessly, and tokens will go away in favor of phones. And before you leave, why was this interesting? I think it's interesting because the attacker view is no longer confined to just sniffing and replaying or stealing someone's uh, insecure tokens, right? Now you actually, we're back at, uh, you have to start hacking things again and not just uh, replay these generic attacks uh, all over. Uh, and the attack surface is moving closer to the enterprise again and away from targeting end users uh, and that all that tired stuff of, I cloned his badge at lunch, right? Uh, that should uh, hopefully go away. Uh, now you actually need to attack and review actual complex implementations uh, and it makes it a lot harder for an attacker, but it also makes it a lot harder for people manufacturing these solutions and it's even worse for the people who have deployed it and are now stuck defending it, right? Uh, so again, we have some IT systems in charge of important decisions uh, with ties to the inside network and zero introspection capabilities because there is no EDR for your access control. Um, and that's why I find it interesting at least. Uh, and then hopefully I have moved the arrows pointing to the danger side at least one step inwards, right? And that was it. Does anyone here have any questions? What readers are currently out there uh, speaking OSDP and like OSDP 2 with encryption? You've already mentioned the signal. Um, what other, I mean, the HID has a very big chunk of the market, but um, what others are there? I, I haven't seen a lot, uh, but you Sato? can. Uh, well, if you go to the OSDP conformance site, they have a list of the OSDP verified vendors, and then you can see, I want somebody who supports biometrics, and then they'll show you, yes, it's this guy, right? 
So ah. you, you have a matrix there of the OSTP verified re uh, readers. And I would definitely get something that's OSTP verified. Uh, because in terms of your tooling, uh, if you want to be able to sniff and see that things are going as they should, getting something that's OSTP verified will also ensure that it's conformant and you will not be very angry because okay. none of About the tools work. About weird work. shit happening, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was looking at it from the, from the, oh, I see this type of reader dangling off the wall. Wonder if it does... OSDP or not? Or the, so uh, in terms of identifying whether the reader does OSDP or not, uh, you have to unplug it from the wall and look at the wires because something sure. like the signal can either be OSDP weekend or, or weekend. Yeah. And it's the same two cables, so you actually need to... Oh. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions? And in the break room? No, there are no questions here that I can see. All right, thank you.